honestly believe that? Yes. Amen. Good, 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 good. Terrific. Uh, so glad you were here. So glad you're here. And God has more in store for us today. Let me highlight just a few things of importance that are going to be taking place over the next few weeks. A few prayer requests and we'll get re-engaged in our worship here today. We have an incredible privilege coming up in February. And that is we have a choir of children from all over the world who were rescued from abandonment and abuse. And uh, they now, with their voices, take the new life they have found in Jesus Christ literally around the world. And uh, Mark Addis made arrangements for us so that they could come and be in our church on Sunday night, uh, February the 18th in that evening service. And so we'll be in here on that Sunday night. Um, when you have about, how many are coming, Mark? 14 children, along with adult sponsors who travel with them. We need to provide lodging for them for two evenings, on Sunday night and on Monday night. And um, if that is something that has some interest to you, that you would like to be a host house, uh, I'm not going to go into all the details right now, and just because you may put your name on a list, that is not meaning you're required to do it. What your name on the list means is that Mark or Jennifer will follow up with you and let you know what the requirements and the conditions are for them staying in your home, what would be expected of you during, during those two evenings, and, and then at that point, you can make your commitment or not. So uh, that's what's the number one sign-up sheet that's on here. So if uh, this is something you think you might like to do, all right, and help out with, then please put your name, your phone number, and your email contact. There's another page underneath that top sheet, and that is we're updating our uh, folks who are available to make desserts for memorial services. Uh, many of you responded yesterday to the service we had for John Christensen. Thank you so very, very much. And John's service yesterday was just a great celebration of his life and his home going. We just kind of sung about that. One day we'll cross that river for its final time. And that is a joy, not a sadness. And it certainly was evidenced in John's service yesterday. Uh, but we would like to update, and maybe some more of you, many hands make light work. We have two more services this coming Saturday. And that doesn't mean every time you get a call you have to say yes, but we try to spread them out. And the more folks who could be on that list, the better off it is. So those are the two things on the sign-up sheet. There is an insert in your bulletin. Uh, on one side, it's about rise up, come see little feet. The other side is about a workshop. It's called work and worship. Uh, this is particularly for those of you who are, are, are still working, you're in business. How do you, how do you relate your life to Christ in the workplace? And this is a seminar from speakers uh, out of the business world, out of the church community. It's done by satellite. Uh, Mark Addis is going to be the facilitator for that. If you have interest in participating in that, on February the 23rd, contact Mark Addis and he will give you all the updated information on it. When you leave today, I hope many of you will either go out these side doors or if you go out the back, make your way around to the pavilion. There's a table set up there done by our deacon commission here. They're going to be out in the pavilion every Sunday for the next four weeks and they'll be highlighting different areas of ministry that they are engaged in that they would love to have additional volunteers for. And today the two they're highlighting are facilities maintenance if you are handy at all with a screwdriver, a light bulb, or a hammer, any of those things, all right, you would qualify, all right? Um, now, if you tend to cause fires and break things, then there's probably another area of volunteer that we can find for you. But if you are a wee bit handy in anything, it, you don't need great skills, all right, just a little bit handy, uh, they're going to try to organize uh, a day every few weeks that uh, folks could come and meet here and take care of, of necessary things around the church. And so you can see them out there at the table. Then greeters and ushers, folks who meet people at the door, hand programs, let them know they're welcome here at New Hope. Um, ushers, folks who take the offering, there's some additional responsibilities with that and things of accountability, opening and closing after, uh, before the first service and after the last service. If those are some ways that you would like to engage in service, you can talk to them out at the table in the pavilion. Please take note of the other announcements that are in there, and I hope you take the time to read about our volunteer, Sue Krause, who leads our Grief Share ministry. She was first a student in our Grief Share Bible study, and it meant so much to her that when there was an opening for leadership, she stepped right in, and what a wonderful heart that Sue Krause has. 
Uh, please take the opportunity, remember, to pray for those who are in your bulletin. Some have been sick and battling that for a while. Uh, some have been in and out of the hospital, and a few of those are here today, and we're happy to see them up and about. Um, our families of care and comfort. And you can add to that the Plogger family as well. Wilbur Plogger's memorial service was on Friday. Uh, if you ever went to a rodeo here in the uh, uh, 50s and the 60s and the early 70s, you know Wilbur Plogger, the greatest rodeo clown and bullfighter there has ever been. Tops, actually. He is in 12 Rodeo Hall of Fames, more than anybody else in that industry. Just an incredible guy. We were privileged to have him here in our community. We were fortunate to have him twice to preach in our church. And uh, at 95 years of age, Wilbur went home to be with the Lord this last Friday. Um, I had on my black Stetson, I had on my boots, I had on my Wranglers, and we went and honored Wilbur Plogger, and it was great to be a part of that. Um, so anyway, do remember to be praying for them. Today, during our prayer uh, that will precede our offering, we will also be praying for the West Side Church of God. Uh, Pastor Paul Binion was with us in the service last night. He's been one of the lead pastors in the uh, southwestern part of Fresno for almost 40 years. And Paul is an incredibly, incredibly good, good man. And so uh, we're going to be praying for him and his congregation uh, as we pray for our offering. Gentlemen, would you come and wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering? Would you join with me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, I love you. I want to thank you for the way in which you have nurtured my soul this week and the times that we've set aside every day to, to let you tune our hearts to yours as we sang about in Come Thou Fount. So we've taken some extra time to focus on you and focus less on some other things of less importance. You have nourished my soul and I'm so very grateful. In our times of unity, Lord, with other pastors and other churches in the seasons of worship that we've been experiencing every night, though the body may be weary, the soul has been significantly refreshed. And so today I give you thanks. Father, I pray for, I pray for one, of, one of your houses of worship on the, about as far from our church as it could possibly be. We pray for Westside Church of God today. We pray, pray for Pastor Paul Binion as he delivers the word this morning. Give him clarity of thought and deliverance of speech as he shares with those who've entered into his place of worship words of life, words of truth. Father, thank you for his consistency and his faithfulness. And we are so grateful for what you've done in and through them over the years. And with great expectation, we trust you for what you will do in the future. Father, we bring to you the needs of this fellowship as well, those who've been battling the flu and other kinds of, of health challenges. Thank you for your sufficiency in their lives. For those who are here today who've been in the hospital and had surgeries and are recovering, we are so grateful for the improvements. For those in our fellowship going through uh, various stages of cancer treatment, Lord, thank you for how you have supplied for their needs and we continue to trust you for the future. Lord, for those families in our fellowship who have experienced the, the momentary sting of death, thank you for the incredible encouragement and hope uh, and support that you have given to them through the knowledge that that, that though their husband, though their dad, though, though a best friend may be ab absent from them for a brief period of time, we have great confidence that they are with you and someday we will be with you as well. Thank you for the comfort and hope that that brings to us. For our privilege of giving and sharing today, Father, we say thank you. We commit this and so much more to you in the awesome name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Can anybody just say Amen. amen. That was fun, wasn't it? I think you guys did as good as last night. Y'all were awesome. All right, outstanding job. Great. Hey, uh, starting tonight in our uh, 6 o'clock service, this is a kickoff to a church-wide study. We'll be doing it on Sunday mornings. I'll be talking generally about the subject. On Sunday evenings, they're going to focus laser in on, uh, on the six-week, five-week Bible study that we'll be engaged in. It's on the subject of open doors, recognizing when God provides us opportunity, how we can tell when a door is closed. Our small groups, 15 or 16 small groups that we have going right now, will be engaged in this study and their small group activities during the week. On Sunday nights, be a little precursor, a little, uh, little extra, all right, that you can have to take to your small group. 
If you're not part of a small group in our church, we believe they are of great importance. It's a way to connect that we can't do it on a Sunday morning. It's a way to meet people you wouldn't get to know at a deeper level any other way. It's a way we provide care for each other as small groups come around us when there's crisis and tragedy and difficulties going on in our world. And if you're not part of a small group, come on Sunday night for the next several weeks. You'll be engaged in that activity. And at the end of that, for those who are not part of a group, you will either have the opportunity to join an existing one or some brand new groups will start up. And if you have any questions about that, you can see Corey or Teddy out in the pavilion after the service. They have a small groups table set up out there as well. And so today, we're going to kind of begin our look at this subject of uh, open doors. There is a book that goes along with it, but I left it down at my chair. So, uh, Shelly, it's right there underneath. I'll hold it up. It's called All the Places to Go, How Will You Know? The Recognition, all right, of Open Doors, done by John Ortberg, a pastor up in Northern California. I'd invite you, if you'd like to get an advance uh, start on the scripture we're going to look at today, it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 through 9. 1 Corinthians is very easy to locate. It's right in front of 2 Corinthians. Um, it's between Romans and 2 Corinthians. All right, that might help you a little bit more. All right, um, middle way through the New Testament, just to the right. Uh, it got a little warm in here for a moment. We turned the air conditioner on just a little bit. Is it relatively comfortable? All right, all right. Church is the place uh, that we afflict the comfortable and we comfort the afflicted. So we, we want to get it right one way or the other for you, all right? Uh, I don't know how many of you remember anymore. I'm starting to show my age, and I talk about people that nobody knows anymore, and I tell stories about things that people have no idea what I'm talking about anymore. How many of you remember a guy by the name of Zig Ziglar? Okay, that either you all are my age or you've, you're well read. Zig Ziglar has been known as the greatest salesman in the history of the world. All right, uh, he had an organization. He started selling steak knives. All right, and I don't think there was anything he probably didn't or couldn't sell unless it was illegal. Um, but but Zig was also a strong, committed believer in Jesus Christ. He loved the Lord with all of his heart. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet him on two or three occasions when I worked at Fresno Bible House, and we had him in town for some events. And and um, uh, Ziegler was a member of Dallas First Baptist Church. Now, back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, Dallas was a mega church before there were mega churches, all right? When there was like maybe 10 in the whole world that ran over 1,000, uh, they were running 10,000, all right? It was a gigantic church in Dallas, Texas. I mean, everything's big in Texas, right? And uh, W.A. Criswell was the pastor. And uh, I read an article in a magazine way back then that said that Zig Ziglar taught the largest adult Sunday school class in the world. And I said, that's a pretty big statement to make. And so I actually did a little, we didn't have Google in those days, but did a little research, made a few calls. And, and here's what I found out. Do you remember when satellite dishes were as big as your house? Okay, the gigantic dish. And it was before you could get satellite in your house. Only businesses, all right, and governments had satellite dishes. First Baptist Church had a satellite dish. Okay, it was gigantic. And Zig Ziglar would teach his Sunday morning adult Sunday school class at Dallas First Baptist Church to a thousand people there at that church. Can you imagine a Sunday school room of a thousand people? That's what Zig Then it was satellite all around the world to various locations. And they said on any Sunday morning, it was not unusual for there to be 10,000 people listening live to the teaching of Zig Ziglar on a Sunday morning. That's pretty awesome, all right? That's pretty incredible. Um, guy had no, no college education, but loved the Lord and loved people. And he used it to absolutely the best of his ability. You say, Tim, why are you telling all this? Because I have a small story to tell you. <laughs> it's, it's a story actually I'd forgotten all about. I, I, I used to tell the story quite frequently at various occasions and completely forgot about the story until was preparing for this opening message on open doors. Ziegler tells a story uh, of a boy who went to the old general store in the little country community where his family lived. And he went with his mom. And every time he went to the general store, he would always try to sneak away from his mom. And when nobody was looking, he would dip his fingers into a large barrel of molasses and then he would lick them. 
drove the storekeeper crazy. One particular day, he thought, I'm going to teach that boy a lesson. And so he watched him, and when he got away from his mother, and he was just about ready to stick his fingers in the molasses barrel, the storekeeper ran up behind him, grabbed him by the belt and the scuff of the neck, turned him upside down, and he dipped him head all in the barrel of molasses, and then he set him out on the front porch of the store. He fully expected that boy to be in tears. But instead of crying, what he heard was the boy praying. And the boy said, God, give me the tongue equal to this opportunity. <laughs> you got to love that boy, man. All right, give me the tongue equal to this opportunity. I have often prayed that prayer before a sermon. Lord, give me a tongue equal to the opportunity. Um, you and I need to recognize even when our head's been dipped in molasses, that God might be providing for us an open door that we could have never, ever imagined. Someone said, as a new year dawns, and I don't know about you guys, do you guys understand, this is only the second Sunday of 2018? It feels like July to me. I don't, the two weeks of this year have seemed to be forever, all right? But this is only the second week, second Sunday of, 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 of this new year. And as a new year dawns, we stand in front of an open door for 2018. This Sunday, we're just looking through the archway of this year. We, we, we can see all things new ahead of us. Behind us, the door has closed. 2017 is finished. What was done is done. What was left unfinished is unfinished. We can't go back and redo anything in 2017, 16, or 15. All we have of those years are our memories. But what we have in 2018 is an open door. Life begins every morning. Each new day is an open door for all of us. Each night of life, a wall goes up between yesterday and tomorrow. Each morning we wake up is a new day to see a new world, new vistas, new aims and goals in our life, new tryings to see, is this the door that God has for me to walk through? It's what we have ahead of us. I love learning new things. You never know when that new thing is going to come valuable to you. I've learned some new things that have been absolutely worthless to me. And I'm probably going to share a few of those right now. Did you guys know that a dollar bill lasts approximately 18 months in circulation? It's never stayed that long in my wallet. Did you know that a pencil can draw a line more than 30 miles long? You got to keep sharpening it, but you can get 30 miles out of a pencil. And out of a pen, you can only get one mile. I don't know what you're going to do with that, but I found it fascinating. <laughs> we're, we're, we're at football playoffs right now. This is important. Practice footballs that are used by NFL teams only last two or three days of practice. The real time playing life of, a, of an average practice football is about five hours of use. Gone. Home teams are required to provide 24 new balls at each game. And each ball sees only about six minutes of real play time. And the New England Patriots have discovered they also have to be inflated to the appropriate. Um, couldn't pass that up. They won last night, by the way. An average person who would live 70 years, and I realize the age is now a little higher uh, than 70 now, but, but an average person who, uh, an average life of a person who lives 70 years, this is how it will be broken up into activities. 23 years, cumulative. You would spend sleeping. I think I'm a little behind this week. 16 years working. 
Now, I realize some of you have worked for 40 or 50 years, but remember, this is continuously strained together. 16 years. Eight years watching TV. Six years eating. There's a few of you that are ahead of that pace. Just, 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 just a little bit. Four years being sick. Two years getting dressed. There's a few husbands who probably think their wife might be a little farther along than that. Sorry, ladies. Sorry, 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 sorry. Here's, here's the sadness. But only a half a year practicing their faith. I'm, I'm confident that's not any of the New Hope folks. All right? But then that's kind of sad, isn't it? You see, just as time is a part of life, so are open doors. And a lot of our open doors are time sensitive. I'm going to talk more about this in a couple of weeks. Let me just throw this out at you. I think when you and I miss a lot of open doors, we have less open doors in our life. When we willfully walk past the open doors of opportunity that God provides for us, we ignore them. I think we end up having less opportunities for open doors in our future. They should not be wasted. Let's let's read the passage. 1 Corinthians 16, 5 through 9. This is Paul who wrote 13 books of the New Testament. He said, after I go through Macedonia, I will come to you. For I will be going through Macedonia. So Paul makes it very clear. All right, I'm I'm coming through your neighborhood. It's kind of like when I was a kid. uh, Every summer, our family went to a church convention. All right, my dad was a pastor. Went to the denominational convention every year. That convention was in different places. Uh, I'd been to Mississippi, been to North Carolina, been to Michigan, uh, been to Arkansas, been to Ohio. And here's what I found out as a kid. The shortest way to any state in the U.S. was through Oklahoma. That, that was my parents' Macedonia, all right? It, just a shorter route. I think my dad would have convinced me that to go to Hawaii, the shortest route would have been through Oklahoma. And, 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 and so Paul said, hey, I'm coming through your country. Perhaps I will stay with you a while or even spend the winter. Oh, you hate relatives like that, don't you? Hey, we're just going to pop in for a visit. Ah, I'm not sure when we're going home. All right, yeah. That's kind of what Paul did here. Hey, I'm going to come through. I want to stay a while. And you know what? I just might stay all winter so that you can help me on my journey. And listen to this, wherever I'm going. <laughs> I'm going to hang out at your place till we figure out the plan. And, and you got to be careful in reading the next sentence. I, I can't pause too soon. I do not want to see you now. See, if you stop right there, it's a bummer. <laughs> I, I really can't look at you right now. I'm, what he's saying is, I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. In other words, I just don't want to come and pop in and leave. If, if I come, I want to have some time to hang out with you. I hope to spend some time with you. I love this next line, if the Lord permits if any of you have ever had opportunity, and I wish Gil and, and Anna Lena were here today. They, I think they get back this coming week. Gil's our missions pastor. He and his, his bride sit right up here on the front with us. Gil is uh, 80, 83, looks 63. I hate him. Uh, but, but if you've ever had a, a, a very long conversation with Gil, or you've had frequent conversations with him, and you were to say something as you would in leaving, hey, I'll see you next Sunday, Gil would respond almost every single time like this, if the Lord wills. If God permits, I I think Gil read Paul. His attitude about life was, I'll put it on my calendar, but just because it's on my calendar doesn't mean it's going to happen. I'm organized, but I also know God may have different plans for me. And that's what we see Paul saying here. This is what's going to happen if this is the open door that God provides for me. But... He said, I will stay on at Ephesus, which seems like he's wanting to get away from. Seems like he feels like he's been there long enough. Okay. But 
I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. I'm going to stay here at least until the celebration of the risen Christ and the return of the Holy Spirit into our lives. Why, Paul? Here's the key line. Because a great door of effective work has opened to me. And there are many who oppose me. Do you hear what he's saying? Evidently, at least the way I read this, Paul's kind of tired. He spent more than eight years on his first two missionary journeys. He has traveled from city to city under heavy persecution, preaching the gospel and planting churches. He's worked tirelessly starting these churches, facing opposition, sometimes even having to flee in the middle of the night in order to keep them from killing him. Now Paul is in Ephesus. This is at the beginning of his third missionary journey, and he's writing to some friends, some good friends at the church at Corinth, and he's saying, hey, I'd like to come. I'd like to hang out with you. I might even spend the winter. I, I, I could use a little R&R. &R. He's hoping to make it there soon. But when we notice the ninth verse that says, but I will stay, I, but I will stay on at Ephesus, because a great door for effective work has opened to me. Even though there's great opposition, there is a door. Paul didn't know it when he wrote these words, but God was opening a great door in this metropolitan area called Ephesus. In fact, Paul ended up staying three years there, more than twice as long as he stayed in any other town in all of his other journeys. And from what we know and from what we can read in the book of Acts, God not only used Paul to start a great church at Ephesus, but while he was there, he was able to plant many other churches in surrounding towns and communities. It became a center for the gospel as it went out to the provinces surrounding him. Now, now the point I want to make at the outset of this series is when Paul saw a great door opening for him, he saw three things about an open door. Three things about an open door. First off, Paul recognized that an open door was a door of opportunity. The second thing he noticed about an open door is it is a door also of obligation. There's responsibilities that come with entering an open door. And number three, open doors don't mean things are going to be easy. The open door is also frequently a door filled with opposition. A door of opportunity. What a privilege we are given when God opens a door for us to be engaged in his life-sharing work. What a privilege and an honor it is. What, we sh what should we do with it? Seize it. Seize the door of opportunity. Don't postpone it. Don't put it off. It, I, I, my brain wasn't working quite so sharp in the 8 o'clock service. And I, I just recently read a, a, a story, and I couldn't remember which evangelist it was. And, and thank God for Google, because uh, Joe Avila Googled it and got me the right name. This was D.L. Moody. This is in the 1880s, I think, 1870s or 1880s. And D.L. Moody tells about a, a time of great sorrow in his life. He was preaching a revival, and things were going so well in the city of Chicago. It's where Moody Institute and now Moody Bible College is. And he was preaching a revival in Chicago. And on a Sunday night, he said, I want to leave you with a question. What will you do with Jesus? And Moody, in one of the, one of the biographies about him, Moody said, you know, I said, I had them right in the palm of my hand. God had been, been present and had them right there. And I thought I was being cute. And he said, I told him, I want you to think about that all week, and next Sunday night, we'll see what your answer is. And before next Sunday night came, guess what happened? The great Chicago fire. And he said in one of his biographies, the crowd of people that were there that first Sunday night would never assemble like that again. He said, I had a door of opportunity and I wasted it. But he said, I never forgot it. He said, I did not give some folks an opportunity to answer what are they going to do 
with Jesus Christ. You see, when, when the door of opportunity opens, we need to seize it because it may not always be an open door. You and I must remember, no opportunity is too big for God to provide for our needs if we will just willingly walk through the door. This, this open door is also a door of obligation. When we say, yes, I will walk through it, we must accept the responsibility that comes with that opportunity. We have been honored, but with that also carries a responsibility to finish the task. Don't leave the opportunity undone and unfinished. And it's a door of opposition. But don't sweat the opposition. This is a victory that you and I are supposed to enjoy. For no opposition is so fierce that God can't defeat it. Do you remember one time when folks tried to close the door on Jesus? You remember that? What, what, what was that? That's not a trick question. The closed door was a big stone. And they rolled it in front of his tomb. And they thought, we've taken care of him. Opposition. But you see, the, the tomb could not hold him. The seal the seal of the emperor could not confine him. The stone was moved. The doorway was open. And God was victorious, as the old preachers used to say, over death, hell, and the grave. There's no opposition. If God has opened the door, I assure you, at the end of the process, victory will be ours. The best example I have at the moment of an open door in my own life and ministry is this church right here. 25 years ago, last October. Actually, it started 25 years ago, last March or April. When after a school event, a man said, are you a pastor? We need one. And that began the thought process of merging a small church in Fresno to a small church in Clovis and two becoming one and having a greater impact together than we ever could have had all on our own. It was a window of opportunity. I could have allowed fear or rejection and I seriously thought about it because there was opposition. I'm no longer part of the denomination that I was when we made the move because they didn't like the idea. There was cost. And yet God has honored. We, we must seize the opportunities when they are there. I think last night's service was an opportunity. It was an open door to begin Unity within the body of Christ, despite the locations of our churches, despite the colors of our skin, despite the culture of our worship. Half those pastors were charismatic guys. They drive me nuts sometimes. But we love Jesus. He's at the heart of who we are. I can handle differences on peripherals as long as we are focused on who Jesus Christ is and that he's come to seek and to save all of us who were lost. We ought not to miss the opportunities of our life because we may be missing out on our very life. Mark Twain, I, I don't know where Mark Twain was spiritually. I've tried to figure it out by reading all of his writings and the histories and the biographies and did he believe in God? I, I really believe he did. Did he have a relationship with Jesus? I, I, I don't really know. He did some pretty wacky things. But here's something that he wrote that captures the moment, I think, for today. Twain said this, There was a very cautious man who never laughed or played. He never risked. He never tried. He never sang or prayed. And when one day he passed away, his insurance was denied. For since he never really lived, the claim, he never died. Isn't that sad? We missed all the open doors in our life, and it's like we haven't lived at all. What I believe is a necessary ingredient for us to, to begin to see, recognize, and seize the opportunities of open doors is the word that's the hallmark of the name of this church, hope. Hope hope. You see, hope looks for the good in people instead of harping about the worst in them. See, often we don't share faith with people because we don't like the worst in somebody else. I suspect if some of y'all had met Tim 35 years ago, you wouldn't have liked Tim Kepler. I know it's hard to imagine. 
It's hard. For, I can't even get that in my head. I suspect if you'd known me 35 years ago, you might not have liked me very well at all either. But hope gets us past what we see in a person and what we don't like in a person. And it may give us an open door to reach out to them. Hope discovers what can be done instead of grumbling about what can't be done. Hope draws its power from a deep trust, not in ourselves or our situations, but a deep trust in God himself. Hope is what lights a candle instead of cursing the darkness. Hope regards problems, whether they are small or large, as opportunities. Hope cherishes no illusions, and it does not yield to cynicism. Hope is the push we need to walk through God's open doors. I don't want to make the same mistake that D.L. Moody did, so I'm going to conclude the service like this. Though this message was not about pointing out the fact that we are all sinners in need of a Savior, you certainly heard enough about that in the music if you paid attention. And Maybe some of you came here today and you had no idea why you were coming to New Hope today. And maybe you came to New Hope so that you could find hope. And hope is not a, is not a verb. Hope is a noun. It's a personal noun. Hope is Jesus Christ. You don't have to understand all there is about the Bible to invite Jesus Christ into your life. And you don't have to wait till next Sunday to do it. You could do it right now at this very moment. You simply know, I don't want to face the rest of my life missing open doors. I don't want to face the rest of my life living life all on my own. And I certainly don't want to face death without knowing that heaven is my home. So why don't you bow with me and pray right now? Use your own words. There's not, a, there's not a professional prayer. There's not a set prayer. There's just prayer. Honest acknowledgement, God, I need you. Honest admission that God loves you. And an honest acceptance, God, come live within my life. Dear Lord, thank you for the open door that you've given maybe to someone right now at this very moment to invite your son, the Lord Jesus, to come live within them. It is a door that stands open before them right now. The scripture tells us that your spirit will not always strive with us. Sometimes we can slam the door on you so many times that it's almost impossible for them to break out. So God, you've given them one more open door today to say I'm not going to put off another day. I'm not going to wait till I get everything figured out and all organized in my world. But today, in the mess that I'm in, I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. And I'll let him help me figure out the future. Thank you for hearing their prayers and answering them. God, your word says that you are looking, looking, looking for any man, any woman, any boy, any girl who will cry out in faith to you. Thank you for hearing their prayer. Lord, there may be some who are here that have been rather cold and indifferent in their relationship to you. But today you've challenged them by the, by, by the stories they've heard, the, the, the music that has ministered to their heart, and, and a few words from Scripture today. They've realized, wow, I've, I've, man, I've been sitting on the back row so long. And for those of you on the back row, I'm not talking about you. But, but Scott, I've, I've kind of been on the sidelines too long. I'm ready to engage and walk through the open doors of opportunities of sharing the life that you have shared with me with others who are around me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we are so grateful for today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. I hope you come back and see us real soon. Don't forget there's some tables out in the pavilion that would love to have you come by and see them.